all these productions, Live. I'm under staff. All right, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the virtual star party we have set for you this evening. My name is Dr. Jenny Krestov. I am faculty at Glendale Community College. I teach astronomy classes and physics classes. And I'm joined tonight by an intrepid team of astronomers here up at Mount Wilson. So behind me on my left is Daryl, who will be operating the telescope. On my right, which is so weird because it's all mixed up, <laughs> is Chris Burns. Um, we also have Mr. Tom Menaghini and Mr. Richard Bell, um, who are all <laughs> kind of parade behind me. Um, FYI, for those of you who may be wondering why we don't have masks on, we are all educators. We have all been vaccinated. We, have, we are fully vaccinated. We've had both shots, certainly for more than two weeks. So we are good to go in this environment. While it is inside the telescope dome, there is no um, recirculating air in here, which is the big thing for you know, wearing masks inside. We are open to the elements. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, let me go to the dome view. This is me over here on the right hand side, and then Richard over by the yellow ladder. And this is the 60 inch telescope, the historic 60 inch telescope here atop Mount Wilson, north of Pasadena in Southern California. And that big dark strip that the telescope is pointing to, that is the sky. So we have the dome open to the sky. Um, as you can tell from my apparel, um, it's quite cool in here. At the moment, it's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. For those of you who like Celsius, it's 12.4. And we have an interesting set of targets for you this evening. So I'm gonna come back to the webcam and let you know that for this evening, we are gonna be looking at the moon. So the moon is just about first quarter? Pretty much, yes. a, little, yeah. a little past, a little past. 50 percent, it's 49 last night. Okay, so it's just shy of, for, would be a little more than first quarter then today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're just past first quarter moon. So the moon is lovely and bright in the sky. So if you are in Southern California, go outside and look up, we'll wait and you can see the moon for yourself. We are looking at the same moon that you guys are looking at. We just happen to have a very big piece of equipment that will give us a high resolution magnified view of that. So the first view that we are gonna have of the moon is through a refracting telescope. So do you wanna pull the refractor over so they can see the setup? Oh, you want me to put the there first? Okay. So we don't want to like give away the whole view of the actual moon. Okay, try that. Okay, we're gonna try this. As you can tell, we're not professional YouTubers. Uh, we need, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so this is the telescope view of, um, or this is the view rather of the telescope couple of telescopes here. Have you got two telescopes in here, Richard? Yep, we we'll have three here, and hopefully by the end of summer. Okay, so there's a lot of telescopes that Richard's been dutifully collecting. This is his, his uh, passion. And the one that is currently being used to look at the moon, is that the one that is centrally this one here. viewed? Yep, the one in the center. Chris is circling it with the cursor. That is a five inch refractor? TMB, yeah, 130 millimeter. 130 millimeter. For my students, that will make sense. Now, the 130 millimeter is that diameter of lens, or is Correct. that focal? focal length is 910 millimeters. 910 millimeters. Compared to the 60. So I would imagine that a lot of my students from Glendale Community College and the Stars and Galaxies class are looking online right now because they are, <laughs> they have to come to a star party for an assignment. 
but I am now confusing my lecture, my lab classes. The lab class were manufacturing their own um, telescopes. Should this be doing anything? Every so often. You can, you can mute it. Okay. So, technical glitch. So the um, lab students were making their own refractors, and that's why I was asking about the diameter of the, the primary lens and the focal length. Um, they had to get a lens and build their own refracting telescopes. It was remarkably successful, um, much more so than I had hoped, but I didn't, you know, when you're teaching an astronomy lab in the middle of a pandemic and I, you can't actually get students to look through a real telescope, well, they make their own. So that was fun. So this is a refracting telescope and we are going to have a look at the moon through this refractor. Ta-da! So at the bottom of that refracting telescope, where you would usually put your eyeball, there is a camera. And it is a ZWO Pro, CWO Pro camera. And this is a live feed image of the moon. This is not a photograph. This is live. And how can you tell it's live? Well, do you want to... Because we had to move it down. Uh, do you want to kick it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to kick the telescope. That would vibrate it. Uh, we can zoom in, I guess, and see if we can see any seeing. Let's see. Let's go in. Let's zoom way in. Whoa. Major zoom. Yeah, so you're seeing a little bit of a, a little bit of motion, but not a whole lot. So one of the things you can tell if, the, if what you're looking at is live is has to do with atmospheric seeing. So the Earth's atmosphere can sometimes be quite turbulent. And it's like looking through a pool of water. If the water is very still, right. you have a nice crisp view. But if the water is kind of moving around, then whatever's on the bottom of the pool will look like it's shifting, even though you know it's not. So here, what you want to look for to satisfy for yourself that this is a live view is kind of a, sh a, a shifting around of all of the features on the moon that we're looking at. If you have what is called good seeing, then you won't see a lot of this shifting around or shimmering. So we have, <laughs> we have an active chat in the YouTube. Oh, you can also tell that this is changing. Okay. That's what happens when you have good seeing. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the moon. There are some craters on the moon here. Um, what do you think the size of these craters would be? Uh, well, dark, My technical dark. experts over here uh, that can quickly look up on Sky Safari Pro, a lovely app that we have to help us out let's with this go. type of information. Let's, let's, find a, let's find an easy to find crater. <laughs> well, there's Mari Tranquilitatis. Yeah, so I can. iPad's over there. There we are. So, so. Mari Tranquilitatis um, is pretty much in the middle of the picture that you're looking at here. So you will notice kind of a round, darker area, which is a mare, kind of upper left, and it's connected to one almost the same size that doesn't look quite so round. It has like two little bulbous areas on the bottom left. And that second one is kind of central to the image that you're seeing of the moon here, um, or central to the image, including the black night sky. Um, the three. Is that the one you're talking no, about? No, Mare Tranquilitatis right is the. That's this one here. Yeah, the second one down. Okay, yeah. This one, that With thing. the two yep. little bulbous things at the bottom. So this is supposed to be the man in the moon, or I like to think of as a third grader in the moon, because the, the upper one on the right is kind of the torso, and you can see at the top there's like the squished head, and then you have a very thin waist, and then you have what looks like the bottom. Uh, and then the legs, kind of misshapen legs coming out of those like a little two farmer. It looks like he's got a little hat on. <laughs> yeah. Right there with a the little hat. A little squished head. And his little legs and body. Yeah. He's got, he's got coveralls. Yeah, we, yes, he could have coveralls. Anyway, Mari Tranquilitatis is the middle large region on which the cursor is presently sitting. So this is what we have. And what is the diameter of Mare Tranquilitatis? Uh, the diameter of that 
is oops. Hundreds of kilometers. 867 kilometers across. 867 kilometers. That's roughly 500 miles. So that is from San Diego to San Francisco? Ish? From here to San Francisco. Or from here to yeah. San Francisco? Is it 500 Francisco. miles? I thought it was only 360 miles. What do I know? I don't know. Someone get miles. from Orange County, too. Google so. Maps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I had to do 60 miles to get past LA. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so that go. is um, the view through our small telescope. Now, this small refracting telescope is not in the same building we are in. It is, uh, I want to say, about a three minute walk away in its own roll off shed. So, this is a rectangular shaped building, and the entire roof rolls off and you can see if Chris goes back and brings the oh sure yep. live stream from the nest cam back over you can see there are kind of partial walls a little on the right hand side and then there's a desk um, with desk chairs on the left hand side you can see the wall kind of at the end and the entire roof has gone and that's it's rolled off like if from where you're looking where the camera is positioned it's rolled off behind you and this gives us a beautiful view of the night sky. Now, is there another camera in there that shows the city? Um, actually, is there? we can. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna rotate the building. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. So, We'll just go over here for a second. There's, there's, there's our beautiful city. There you go. Yeah, that's what I <laughs> wanted to show them. This is the city. So, and that is the dome <laughs> rotating, a little squeaky. So Mount Wilson, when it was first constructed, this observatory um, was at a lovely dark site, but it was for, first constructed back in the early 1900s. First light through the 60-inch telescope was in 1908. In 1908, LA was really small and they didn't have a lot of lights. So hmm, it was a great observatory. It was the largest in the world, in fact. But, well, now you can see the lights of LA. It makes observing from Mount Wilson less ideal. So large telescopes are now located in dark sites um, and Chile and Mauna Kea and Hawaii are two of the best sites in the world for professional grade telescopes. Um, but for observing, Mount Wilson is still pretty cool in large part because it is so close and it is so accessible for so many people in LA. All right, so shall we show them the view through the 60 inch? Sure. So make sure I don't move the this wrong. is the 60 inch telescope right oh. over here. And we call it the 60 inch telescope because the primary mirror, which actually does all the light collecting, is the most important part of a telescope. So light comes from the moon, reflected sunlight from the moon, or from stars, or from planets, or wherever you're looking. It comes down the tube, um, it heads out in all directions, some of it comes down our tube, and at the bottom of the, the, uh, the whole telescope structure here, there is a mirror. And that reflects light back up to a secondary mirror, down to a tertiary mirror, and then out the side. Now, Daryl is hanging out with something red. He's got his left hand on it, and I'm not sure you can actually see it, but that is the um, ZWO camera here in the 60-inch uh, dome, or the 60-inch telescope dome. And I think he is just fine-tuning the focus. Down, down, up, Which up. Which is a, uh, this one? Yeah. It's a no, fun, no, no, it's a fun process. 
Worse, better, better, worse. Yeah. It's not automatic focus like your iPhones have. There we go. See, it's getting better. Okay. Shall we go and give them a we, view? We can give them a view. And they, can All right. they can watch us there endlessly play with the focus now. Oh, yeah. There we go. There we have the moon. And this is through the 60-inch telescope. So the difference between the refractor, the the five-inch refractor um, that Richard has his camera set up, and then the 60-inch reflector, um, the 60-inch reflector obviously can collect a lot more light. And it has a much, much narrower field of view. So what we're looking at here isn't most of the moon, such as we saw in the last image, but it's a very um, small field of view, a, a kind of a zoomed in portion of the moon. Now, to be honest, I have no idea which craters these are and what part of the moon we're looking at. The expert has just walked away. Actually, we're right in here. Oh, are you? See the two right there and then the wall? Oh. The two right there and the wall? Okay. So, um, well, we're just finding out which craters we're looking at. Oh, right in here, I believe. We are looking at that big one is called Archimedes. Ah, Archimedes. That's where you So, Archimedes, I don't know if one of you wants to grab the cursor oh, right. over there, is the larger of the craters here. That's Archimedes' crater. Obviously, Archimedes never got there since he lived. Uh, a couple thousand years ago, before humans made it to the moon. It is named in his honor. Many of the features are named um, in honor of scientists. Um, scientists from all over the world, male, female scientists. Uh, it's, it is an honor to have you know, a feature on a, another celestial object named after you. Um, this particular crater is 81 kilometers in diameter and Archimedes is a Greek physicist and mathematician who lived 287 to 12 to 287 to 212 BCE. Now the two smaller craters um, just up and to the left of Archimedes um, Aristillus? Mm -hmm. I don't, I've never heard of Aristillus. Let's see if Sky Safari knows who that is. Greek astronomer, surprise, oh, Greek surprise. Greek astronomer. <laughs> oh, he was contemporary with Archimedes, 280 BCE. Yeah. Maybe that's why they got craters next to each other. Aristillus. I've never heard of Aristillus. Look him up. Yeah. Okay, and the other one is, ooh, that's an interesting name. Autolycus. 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 A U T O L Y C U S. Interesting. And what you want to bet? Greek astronomer. It's a Greek astronomer. <laughs> well, you know, the Greeks did some good astronomy back in the day. This is 310 BCE, so he's a little older. A little older. Yeah. Okay. So, so we are looking at craters here that would have been up and to the left of all the mare that were visible in the previous. Um, view of the moon. All right, now I'm going to point out another really cool feature, and the reason that we're actually in this location is right over here in this bunch of uh, mountains. There's a space in here, and that is where Apollo 15 made a touchdown back in July of 1971. 71 or two? 71, I believe. 71. Yeah. I was very young then. Now, this was one of those, um, I don't know if this is the first that had a rover, but they did have a rover on their mission. A lunar buggy. A lunar buggy. And they got in it, and they could drive further away than the astronauts could walk. And they went and they explored this interesting feature here, which is... Basically, it looks like a, a gully or a, 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 that's what I'm looking for. A, a valley? Sharper than a valley, but they believe this is the, a, a collapsed lava tube. And so you Ooh, get Oh, it's rill. Rill, that's it. They're a called rills. <laughs> they're, 
It is a sinuous rill, rill. yes. And this one's called, I forget what it's called, hold on. It's named after the mountain that is close to... Uh, get in here. Hadley, that's it. Hadley Rill. So I'm going to maybe center that a bit better. So that we're looking at Hadley Rill. So I don't know if you've ever watched any of the videos of the astronauts when they were on the moon. There's a very famous one, I'm not sure which astronaut it was, that was talking about, or that dropped a hammer and a feather to show that Galileo was correct in that two objects would fall, of different masses, would fall at the same rate. Um, if you drop a hammer and a feather from kind of shoulder height here on Earth, they're not gonna fall at the same rate because the feather will encounter air resistance. Um, the hammer, less air resistance, <laughs> it goes pretty quickly down. And so there's a lot of people, and back when Galileo made his finding or, or proclaimed that all objects, regardless of mass, fall at the same rate, people didn't believe him. They thought that larger rocks would fall more quickly than smaller rocks. And he famously went up to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped a large and a small rock at the same time, and an assistant at the bottom confirmed that they did actually land at the same time, so that the larger rock did not land Oops. a few seconds before the smaller one. I believe the Leaning Tower of Pisa was used because it was the tallest building around. I'm not sure if it was actually leaning at that point. But uh, anyway, yes, to test Galileo's hypothesis, in, you'd need to be in an environment where there is no air resistance to actually showcase this. And that is exactly the environment that the moon has. So there was this famous video, and you can go to other places on YouTube, um, open up another window and <laughs> go to YouTube, and then the hammer and the feather on the moon. Um, it's quite an interesting uh, little video to watch. They had fun on the moon, I think. That was it a good one. It would be a fun yeah. place. Totally. All right, so we got Hadley Rill. And there's another rill down here, too. I think it's part of the same system. The same collapsed lava tube? Yeah, team. possibly. Crevasse, is that what so you would instead of valley? By the way, we should uh, ask if anybody has questions, and we should check the we'll YouTube comments. Questions. You can ask questions on the YouTube feed if you like. Um, oh, hey, Justin. We've got Justin and Liz and Lua. Oh, my goodness, Teddy. Ah, Beckstrom University, back from Michigan. Welcome back. And then we have a couple of the... Uh, MWO regulars in the Olson Observatory. And then... Oh, there's someone commenting about it's really neat to see the advantage, advances in technology since the software BISC slash CCD soft. Oh, yeah. On the 24-inch <laughs> refractor with telescopes that were in use in education in the early 2000s. I have no idea what that means, but oh, okay. No, the software has come a long way since those oh, days. Yeah, reflector. A lot of it actually is also because the, tel the, the computers themselves that are running it have faster processors, so you can do really interesting things, which we'll, we'll try to demonstrate later on, uh, which is one of which is called live stacking, uh, which would have been very hard to do with older computers because they wouldn't have had the uh, speed. Also, I should probably mention that we're using what's called a CMOS camera, and this is different than the CCDs uh, we also use on telescopes, and the big difference is that the readout is very fast. So you can run these things almost like a video camera. Oh, they don't need to see me. <laughs> well, you know, the moon's you're much more interesting. <laughs> you're explaining things to them. Uh, yeah, so, so that, that camera we looked at on the telescope is uh, connected to a uh, PC that is strapped to the back of the telescope, uh, and they communicate with a USB 3.0. Hey, why don't you do a roving view and show them what it's like? I, I could do that. Why don't you grab that? Okay. Okay. We so we, we set up out. a <laughs> an iPhone camera, an iPhone 
job easily has a camera, that Chris can take around and show you everything. So let me just see um, and put in the chat because we haven't done this in a couple of weeks. Put in the chat if you can no longer hear us, um, but hopefully this will work. So I'm going to go to the mobile view. Whoops. Mobile view. Oh, for goodness sakes. Mobile view. Oh, and then you have to un... You yep. muted yourself? I am muted. Yep. Okay, so hopefully people can hear me. Uh, and it's not too loud. All right, so this is coming up to the back of the telescope. And first off, here is the computer. So this is a mini PC. And as you can see, it has been bolted to the side of the telescope, which makes it super convenient because then we have a USB wire that goes all the way around and then comes around. And this is our camera. And for those who are interested, who are buffs, this is an ASI 294MC Pro. And I am told that the Pro means that there is really good cooling on this uh, CMOS. And one of the things you have to do with these kinds of cameras that are trying to see very low light levels is you try to reduce what's called thermal noise. So if there's any heat on the camera, that shows up as noise in the image. And so the more we can cool this down, uh, the better the image is going to be. And luckily, tonight's a nice cool night, so we can probably get it down to about minus 20, minus 25 degrees Celsius. So that's always a good thing. Okay. That's... There is a request that you show the mirror Oh, okay. Sure. Well, it's not on the back side of what you're It's downstairs. No, no, it's over here. Oh, it's over there. All right, I'm gonna back up so you can kind of see this in context with the rest of, maybe if I go all the way back here. So that telescope, all the way down, we're looking at 10 tons, or the whole thing is 25 tons. So this whole telescope weighs 25 tons, and that's a lot of weight to put on a bearing. And so what they did was they put a giant float, a, a sort of disc shaped float about the same size as this. Um, well, it looks kind of like a rectangular uh, casement here, but if I come around this side, you can see it's actually sort of a cylinder. And within that, there is, I think it's something like 600 and some odd pounds of mercury. And the float, displaces all that mercury up the sides of this tank, and that takes the majority of the weight of this entire telescope. So the telescope is floating on a bath of mercury. Now, in the old days, that was open to the air. <laughs> so uh, the mercury could oxidize, and that was no good. So now we have it safely encased uh, in this tank, but it's a really good way to, oh yes, and we can go and make sure, let's go, let's go check and make sure that the mercury level is, uh, is topped up. I really hope it is because I didn't bring any mercury. Uh, let's see, I think so. So that is our indicator and I think you can probably tell that it is topped up. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> no leaks. No leaks. Is there anything else folks want to see before we uh, move on to things else? Other things? Hang on, sorry. I'm just gonna I'm gonna unmute I'm gonna mute now. Okay, we're back. So that was a little tour around. And Chris is just putting the camera down. I'm gonna back to the dome view, which is us here. Chris is back. So that was the um, mercury vat. And there was a comment that the volume was too low. Was so the volume was too low on my camera? Uh, well, no, just through here. So I turned it up in OBS. OK, cool. So uh, I think we're anyway, the wall. that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry about it. I did turn the volume up. So it did get a lot louder. Um, 
hopefully you can hear that well now. But that was a bit of a tour of the equipment that we're using. And now we're going to go back to the moon? Ooh, we're going to go to a feature called the Big Wall. And I am going to go back to the attic view. This is Hadley's Rill and Archimedes, a couple other Greek astronomers who have craters named after them. Um, and we are going to slew the telescope to change position. So now you can see we're going across the face of the moon. And that, I think, is the head part of the man in the moon, or what I like to think of as a third grader in the moon, actually. Um, slewing the telescope. You know, I don't know if there's any other usage for the verb slew. Um, to slew a telescope, and I believe it's spelled S-L-O-O-H. Yeah, S L E W. But SLU S L O O H is the. Um, you can book your own time on a lie on a remote telescope if you're interested. Um, but slewing a telescope is moving it slowly. So there's uh, slewing in two directions: right ascension and declination, which are the coordinates that astronomers use to to map the sky, if you can envision the lines of latitude and longitude kind of projected onto the celestial sphere, those are the lines of declination and right ascension. So they go from the north celestial pole to the south celestial pole, that's right ascension lines, and then declination is similar to latitude, and they go from the celestial equator north or south. So if you are going to slew the telescope, you are going to slew um, in either right ascension or declination or both, and move where the telescope is pointed very slightly. So the moon is actually a remarkably small target for telescopes um, to, well, it, the moon is a remarkably small object for you guys to see if you go out. You think, oh yeah, the moon's pretty big, and you know it's really big, it's a quarter of the diameter of the Earth, but if you actually go out and look up at it, you can hide the moon behind your pinky finger if you hold your pinky finger up at arm's length. So you go outside, stick your arm straight out, and, the, and your pinky finger will easily cover the full moon. So the moon is actually quite small. But even then, this camera and this telescope are zooming right into a very small piece of it. So we are only moving the telescope very, very minute amounts to change what part of the moon we are actually looking at. And fun fact, the telescope has to be told to track at a different speed than it does when we're looking at stars. And that's because, thanks to the moon's orbit around the Earth, it's not traveling across the sky at the same rate that the stars are. The stars move because the Earth is spinning on its axis, and that also makes the moon look like it moves, but because the moon also has its orbit, it goes at a slightly different speed. And if we don't have that speed set on the telescope, uh, it actually starts moving pretty quickly. In fact, out of the field why, of view, yeah. Hey, you guys, why don't you turn on sidereal time for just a, a sidereal tracking, just so we can see it move? Yeah, no, just put it on sidereal tracking. So we can see how quickly it's All right. moving out of the field. So of view. what we're doing now is we're now tracking the stars rather than the moon. And what should happen is over time. It should move. Yeah. So what you're seeing now, this motion that you're seeing, is the orbit of the moon. And you can tell that there's some motion because there's a little tiny arrow, the cursor, it's left in the middle of the image and it's getting farther and farther from a little crater just down into the right of it and closer and closer to the bigger crater up into the left. So this is the difference between how the stars seem to move across the sky and then how the moon seems to move across the sky. So the motion of the stars, they're not actually moving on a human time scale, but we 
can see. Um, but they seem to go east to west across our sky, as does the moon. Because the moon orbits the Earth, you have to kind of superimpose that orbital motion on top of the east to west motion because of the rotation of the Earth. So you've got a bunch of things that you have to account for if you're going to accurately track the moon. And if you're just looking at it with your eyes like we are now, you're like, yeah, 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 I can totally like focus on the crater and whatnot. But if you're taking a picture of it and you have a long exposure, something on the order of three or four minutes, then you can imagine how much motion you would see in your photograph um, when the moon, if you're not tracking the moon perfectly. So it's a complicated instrument up here. Mm -hmm. I should probably also mention why we're in this particular location on the moon. Did we talk about what, the, what we're looking at? No, oh, I have no idea okay. what we're looking at. We're looking at this. <laughs> this is a feature on the surface of the moon uh, that is called, and now I've lost the word. It's an escarpment. It's a Latin thing. So it's an escarpment. It's called Rima Ariadeus, or awesome. more colloquially known, colloquially known as the Big Wall or the Long Wall. Let me see. It says it here. Um, no, it doesn't say. But I think it's, it's called the Big Wall. And it's 247 kilometers from, from end to end. Uh, and that's roughly the distance between LA and San Diego. Yeah. So that's what you're kind of seeing. It's a two and a half hour here. drive, yeah. is what we're looking at there. If you're driving, you know. But there's no regular, traffic on the moon, so. There's no traffic. Well, good. which means you wouldn't be held up. As long as you're not speeding, it would be about a two and a half hour drive. Just saying. All right. Okay. That would be fun in the moon buggy. I'd love to try mm. that. <laughs> Should ask if anyone has any requests for moon places to go to. Oh, yes. So we have uh, Tim Thompson up there. Oh, hey, Tim. We have the Arc Center of Excellence for Dark Matter. Oh, there was a question about what the blue tube on the side of the telescope near the mirror cell is. Oh, that. Ah, hang on. Let me go back to the view um, as seen of the we dome so that we can answer that question. <laughs> okay, so this giant tube here. Go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> oh, there we go. Do they mean this one here? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if they'll hear me all the way over here so you can repeat if, if it doesn't come Well, hang on. Let me move the microphone over. Whee! Here, you can have a mic. Ah! Oh, goodness. Okay, so now they're going to correct me if I get this wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, inside that tube there is a weight. Down inside there's Down a inside. on this cable. Yeah, and then as the telescope moves to different positions, that weight slides up and down that tube and keeps things balanced. Exactly. There you go. Uh, actually, let me, let me get the, let's do the roving view because it's really cool to see how that system works. Okay. All right, so let me go to mobile view and turn you on and this off. Okay, so hopefully it's a little louder now. Oh, yes. All right, so the question was about this tube that goes down the length here. And I'm going to try and show you what's down that tube. If anyone's got a flashlight, that'd be great. Okay. And down there, hopefully what you can see is there is a weight and it's got wheels on it. So it slides nicely up and down that tube. And that's attached to this cable. The cable goes through this pulley and over this cam system. And now I'm gonna come over this side. And all this interesting gearing here, I think it does multiple things. One thing that it does is it slides this mirror, this, sorry, not mirror, uh, this weight up and down. This is for spectrum. Right, and this thing here, all this interesting stuff is for a particular mode of the telescope in which the light bounces from the secondary mirror at the very top 
down to, and we can't really see it, but right in there, there is what we call the tertiary mirror, the third mirror. And if we want to send the light down the axis, what's called the, the declination axis, all the way down there. Oops, oh, okay, under there, there's spots for it to go. Um, it goes down to what's called a spectrograph. Let's see, can we see more can things up there? No yolk, there's a hole in the yolk. Yeah, it's it's kind of can't, quite get, can't quite get to it. But anyway, the point is, in order for that light to bounce the correct angle down the declination axis and through the floor into where that uh, spectrograph would be, uh, means that that mirror has to change angle as the telescope tracks around the sky, mostly in declination. And so all this gearing here is just the engineering solution to maintaining that correct angle. So the telescope has a lot of interesting moving parts. Hopefully that answered your question. All right, so we are back. Anybody got any ideas of where to go on the moon or are we going to go on to something else? I don't know. Do we have any requests? M82? I don't think M82 is on the moon. Oh, not on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> the question was for um, favorite lunar features. So it's an adjustment for the Coudé focus was the question. Yeah, that's the, yeah, it's the, it's the Coudet focus, and the Coudet focus is what takes you down to the spectrograph, which is down in a room below the telescope, and it doesn't move, so it's not attached to the telescope. Uh, there was another spectrograph that you could put on the telescope that would be mounted onto the telescope, and it would just stay in the same place on the tube, but because the Coudet always has to point into the same location on, in the observatory, that mirror has to always adjust its angle as the telescope goes up and down. Coup day for elbow. And for those of you who didn't understand it, don't worry, that's like technical stuff. It's not on the test. It's not on the, <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the test. So if you have any um, other requests for lunar features. Otherwise, we can move on. Move on to a different object. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is the clown base? Oh. We okay, we are going to go on to NGC 7642, is that right? The Clown Face Nebula. Now, funnily enough, in my class yesterday, we were talking about nebulae. So this is a special type of emission nebula called a planetary nebula. Right there, which has NGC absolutely nothing to do with planets. 2992. 2992. Oh, I got it really wrong. What was I thinking of? I don't know. I'm sorry, I'd just be blind. Well, maybe he got it really wrong. 2392. 2392. So objects that are viewed in space often have many designations, depending on which catalog. I want to watch the telescope move. Oh, yeah. OK, wait, this one? Oh, the dome view. Great. OK. So this is where we get to watch the telescope move from one target to a different target. And the telescope is moving, as you can see. The telescope moves nice and Quiet. quietly. The dome, not. <laughs> the dome, not so much. The dome's cranky. It's had a hard day. It's the beginning of the week. She's getting a little heavy in her old day. She's 100 tons. <laughs> Hundred tons of dome. Yep. It squeaks more in one direction though than the other, doesn't it? Um, I think Tom was saying that. It also squeaks more in the beginning of well, this time of year until sometimes when she warms up and then she's just yeah. too much. Yep. And in the dead of winter. Oh. Sometimes it groans and you hear a rumble. Yep. So the telescope is now pointing more west. West is kind of behind me. And we are looking for a um, planetary nebula. 
I'm going to turn the big lights off now. So I'm going to get back over here. For those of you who may be new to planetary nebulae, a planetary nebula results from the uh, kind of final stages of evolution of a medium mass star. So stars come in all different masses. Um, some are considered low mass. They haven't evolved to their final stages yet. Um, the medium mass stars, like the sun, uh, some have, some haven't, and the high mass stars, they tend to evolve very quickly. The medium mass stars and the high mass stars have quite dramatic um, final stages. Certainly the high mass stars go supernova, a type 2 supernova, and that's very impressive. Um, but a medium mass star, the core collapses when there's no more fuel to um, fuse, and there's no more thermonuclear fusion, kind of to hold the star up. Gravity, which is relentless, collapses the star, and following that collapse, there's kind of puff, puff of things coming out, kind of a rebound. And this is um, envelope, kind of an envelope of gases that expand through space, and over time, those gases get farther and farther and farther away. The core of the collapsed star is emitting a lot of UV radiation. The core of the collapsed star is a, is a white dwarf. It's emitting a lot of UV radiation, and the gases that have expanded away absorb that energy, and then will re-radiate that energy in the visible wavelengths. So a lot of the gases that are expelled are hydrogen atoms, um, helium, oxygen. These are common gases that are formed um, in stars and are you know, make up the star. So you'll see a lot of the colors indicative of this type of these types of atoms glowing. So red for hydrogen, kind of a peachy yellow for helium, and then if it's doubly ionized oxygen, you'll have a lovely blue. So you want to kind of look for these colors when you're looking at nebula. Um, okay. The planetary nebula are much smaller than like the giant emission nebulae, um, like the Orion Nebula, for example. Um, yep. They result from the collapse of the medium mass star, so they are necessarily less massive than a single star, whereas something like the Great Orion Nebula can have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of stars worth of mass. There it is. Over time, these planetary nebula do. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Planetary nebula, dissipate. they just, dis thank you, dissipate, Richard. <laughs> I knew it was a D something. <laughs> Diffuse, uh, no, dissipate. Um, it can take thousands of years for them to do this, but eventually all the gases which are heading out will dissipate, and then you won't see the planetary nebula anymore. Yes. So it, inevitably there will, be have plan there will have been planetary nebula that existed in the past for which there is no evidence anymore. Those gases will completely have dispersed. Um, there are some stars that will produce planetary nebula. The sun, for example, will eventually produce a planetary nebula, but not for billions of years, so you're good. But the one that we are going to see tonight um, has many different monikers. So NGC 2392 is one of them. Um, it's also known as the Clown Face Nebula. I personally don't see a clown face in the nebula, but apparently someone at some point did. Are we ready for it? It should rotate pop. the dome awesome. in about two seconds. Are oh, you going to rotate the dome a bit? Oh, someone was moving it. <laughs> it's a very interesting effect, though. Yes, <laughs> it's raindrops in space. So what's the exposure time for this? Uh, right now we're up at 10 seconds. Here we and are. And we can actually lower it and boost our beam, but not yet. Now, one thing, uh, for those of you who have seen us do this before, there's a few changes tonight. One is we have another camera. So before we were using a different camera. Again. 10 seconds of movement. Okay. Uh, so in previous time, previous sessions, we were using an attic camera. 
Uh, but we now have this one, which is a little bigger. So it gives us a bigger field of view uh, through the telescope. And I think it's actually giving us, a little, it's definitely giving us more uh, dynamic range because I think this has a, a deeper well, right? Yeah, the, the actual pixels are like cups. And these cups are three times the size of the addict. And the mouth of the cup is actually about 20% bigger. So it makes it easier to collect yeah. light. And you actually, last time the addict was over here was showing this just as red, that means they're saturating. They weren't actually showing medium reds and light reds and stuff like that. And the other nice thing about this object is you can see that it's not just one ring of material coming out from the star, but multiple rings. And that just goes to show that the process that's making these doesn't necessarily only happen once. It can happen multiple times in the life of the star. And then you get these shells that expand out into outer space. Now, the other thing that we have tonight is a pretty sizable amount of moonlight. So you'll notice in the background that uh, there seems to be more darkness towards the bottom of the view and, and a bit more brightness to the top. And I'm going to guess that that direction is the direction of the moon. So I'm going to make it brighter and then try to reduce our... Yeah, so what Richard is doing now is he's playing around with the gain and the exposure time. And we're trying to get a nice balance between information coming out and not getting swamped out by that background glare from the moon. And this is a very good night. Uh, again, for those of you who've joined oh. us in previous nights when the seeing was uh, not great, uh, mm. this is, this is a, a nice welcome change and it's likely because we're now going into the summer months when uh, we typically get better seeing at the mountain than during the winter. Winter observing here on Mount Wilson is notoriously, uh, notorious for the poor seeing. Those darn Santa Ana winds. Mm -hmm. Are you checking the... Mm -hmm. okay. So there's a chat in the YouTube, or there's a little conversation in the YouTube chat about astrophotography. So there are people asking questions and offering advice and things. Cool. As I am not an astrophotographer, I am staying well out of that conversation because yeah. I really don't have anything to add other than these cameras that we got here, which you can do astrophotography <coughs> with, seem to be quite amazing. Yeah, they just keep getting better and better. They really, <laughs> really do. Stack. This is going to be my next question. So we have a few stars in the field. Oh, we have to clear the moon. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. yep, no clear moon. the moon image. Uh, so we have a few stars in the field of view, and what we're going to try and do now is take Ooh. multiple short exposures, and the software will use the positions of the stars to line up each exposure one after the other and average them together. And when you take images like this with what we call a noisy background, all that, that glare in the background is sort of random. Mm -hmm. And it's as you... Good. And it's failing. Is it failing? Oh, well. Yeah, so. C'est la vie. Uh, oh, yeah. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do this on, uh, on a globular cluster, because then we've got tons of stars to work with. Yeah. Uh, the idea here is that because the background noise is, is all random, if you average it out, then it should average to some smooth amount and then the real stuff, the stars, the nebula, and things like that, they will just get better and better. They'll get more and more uh, less, or I should say, they'll have less and less noise in them. Yeah, life stack will not even. Okay, well, we'll just go back to regular, regular yeah. viewing. Our <laughs> regular programming. Our regular program, <laughs> exactly. Back to our regular programming. Ah, there it is. The other nice thing about these CMOS cameras, um, the advantage they have, at least in the designs we, we've been getting, is they have something called a Bayer filter over the top. And so each pixel on the array has its own filter in front of it. And each two by two set of pixels has a blue, a red, and two green pixels. And the software can use that information and combine it to give you a color image in real time. So you don't have to do what we used to do, which is, take a picture with a red filter, 
take another picture with a blue filter, take another picture with a green filter, and then you know, using Photoshop or something like that, combine them after the fact. This does it in real time, which is really, really handy. But for those of you who may not be aware, just about all the super pretty pictures that you will find online have had image processing after the fact. So a lot of the uh, nebulae that my students posted on the chat last night and possibly are posting tonight, um, those are going to be processed. So the dark will be made darker to really bring out the contrast. And there was a beautiful image of the Horsehead Nebula, but I'm looking at it going, whoa, wait, that's the weirdest Horsehead Nebula picture I've ever seen. It was stunning. But I'm like, huh. So instead of the horse head being dark, that backlit by the red of the hydrogen gases glowing, stretching, it? it was a completely black background. And then the Horsehead it Nebula itself it was bright. And I looked at that and I'm like, well, hang on. If you're looking at the dust and the dust is bright, then you're going to be looking in the infrared. And I went online and sure enough, did some digging and found out that it was an infrared image of the Horsehead Nebula. Mm -hmm. Probably taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope because infrared, for the most part, doesn't make it all the way through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, it's a beautiful image, but that would have had a lot of image processing. So in the same same way, if you've ever watched those, you know, kind of the before and after of celebrities being photoshopped for magazines, um, you're going to have a similar sort of before and after. Well, for I don't know. I mean, that's that's really lying, right? Because they're they're actually removing. Yeah, that's true. They're, they're removing wrinkles and things for astrophotography or the image processing. They're just enhancing. They, they know what colors are there because their the spectro yeah. the spectrographs can actually read the wavelength. They know exactly what colors there, and they're just intensifying those colors. So they're just really cranking up the intensity. Yeah, we're just getting um, more cool. and the uh, and the contrast. So the colors are brighter, and the darks, the, the black is darker. So you can see here right now. The black sky isn't truly black, right? We've got some, you know, refraction, reflection from the atmosphere because we have a, a, a first quarter moon tonight. Um, but this Some is, this, if you, if you go online and just look at the Clown Face Nebula, you will see beautiful images, possibly taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is above the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't have blurring effects. And, um, it's just a really good telescope. So, do you want me to reduce the exposure? You can play with it as much as I can. So. Well, I'll just make it easier for you to. to... Oh, wait, no, that's not that's what I'm going to do. Oh, they're just playing around with the software now. Uh, we're not playing. We're, we're trying to focus a little bit better, that's all. They're adjusting the parameters for a better view. How's that? Fine. <laughs> So as you can probably tell right now, we're not really in focus, so Richard's gonna try and bring that a little bit better. Oh, Tim, I didn't know you worked on Spitzer. That's better. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's good, okay. Think we're good? That's good. Okay. All right, so let's bring the exposure up. Um, for those of you at the ARC Center of Excellence for Dark Matter, um, yes, we do have live stream schedule. Um, if you go to the glendale.edu slash planetarium website, that is my little website. I'm the planetarium director at Glendale Community College. So glendale.edu slash planetarium has the Oops. schedule. And, oh, it was just put in the post. Yes, it... It will take you to a much longer website, but um, that does have the schedule. The, the program that we have set up through the college runs through the end of May. So we do it every two weeks. So the week of the first quarter moon, and then we try for the week of new moon when we don't have a moon in the sky, we can get dark objects. 
Um, that is that program and this program ends at the end of the spring semester. But I was just talking with Tom Meneghini, who's the executive director here at Mount Wilson Observatory, and we are contemplating a kind of STEM outreach program over the course of the summer where we will have more live streams um, like this, that we're, we will try and um, bring in and encourage people who don't usually have a chance to get up to Mount Wilson uh, to come and see it virtually, if not in person. So one of our audience members tonight on YouTube is in Australia and obviously can't make it here right now. Um, but yeah, this is the next best thing. Uh, I think you're gonna be opening up? I mean, Turning for June 15th. June 15th is when California is supposed to be able to open up. Um, so they're, we're gonna try and open up for live or for real in-person observing. Um, you can rent a night on either of Mount Wilson's large telescopes, either the 60 inch or the 100 inch telescope. You and 24 of your close, 23 of your closest friends, I think Max is out at 24? 25 for this one. 25 um, individuals can fit into the dome for the 60 inch and less for the 100 inch, right? 20. 20 for the 100 inch. Um, it has less available floor space, so to speak. Um, the telescope does move around, so you don't want to be in a big crowd and be hit by a moving telescope type of thing. Um, ooh, promoting the streams to scouting groups for STEM. Absolutely. These, so there's only a few left for um, this outreach from GCC. But if you want to tell all your scouting groups, by all means, please spread this uh, information far and wide, as far as Australia, apparently, among other things. Okay, so are the nebulae actually that color? And they are intensifying them simply because we know what color they are? Yes, that's exactly it, Liz. Or are they really not as intense and we're just making them more so? Okay, so one of the thing with nebulae is if you actually, and a lot of people are quite disappointed when they look at a nebula through an eyepiece, even with a big telescope, they're quite disappointed by the fact that it's very faint. But you have to understand that the number of atoms in a nebula is very low. So the air you breathe is 10 to the power of 19 atoms per cubic centimeter. In a dense nebula, it's about 10 to the 6 atoms per cubic centimeter. So there's a lot less atoms in a nebula in outer space than there is in the air you breathe. And we certainly tend not to think of the air we breathe as particularly dense or particularly packed full of atoms. Surprise, surprise, yes it is. So when you're looking at a nebula, the colors are real, but the intensity would depend on the number of atoms, would depend on the number of photons being emitted from that area. And the number of photons is going to be based on, I guess, how often the electrons will transition in a particular atom, but also, more importantly, how many atoms there are in the nebula. And many of these planetary nebula are just fairly rarefied. They don't, I mean, they're certainly emitting light. So I would say that the intensity is bumped up to be more than what you would be able to see with your eyes. Um, but your eye, what you see refreshes three times a second. So the signal that goes down your optic nerve from your eye refreshes every third of a second, roughly. If your eyeballs could accumulate two, three, five, ten seconds worth of light, you would be able to see, you would collect more photons and you would see it at higher intensity and you would see it more brightly. This is what we're doing with 
cameras. So what you would see would be faint and diffuse and probably not particularly colorful. Does that mean that if you collect photons over a 10 hour exposure, that is not real? It is real. These are the photons, but it's not what your eye would see. So there's a difference between what you can observe and then what telescopes can detect and show us in images. So it's not dishonest, but it's not what you could see with your eyes. But, you know, our eyes are amazing organs, but they're limited. Ooh, that's a bright light. They're limited by our biology, if that makes sense. Yeah, most people don't get to look through an eyepiece attached to a 60 inch telescope. Very true. But that's the moon. Yeah. The moon's actually silhouetting light on the ground over here. Oh, within the dome, we have yeah. shadows cast by the moon? Yeah. Moonlight going down the truss. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. Down the truss of the telescopes. Yeah, look at that. The moon is, well, you know, it's even in, even in Pasadena, most people, are, or Glendale, or Burbank, or wherever you are, most people don't realize how bright the full moon is. Now, those people who are isolated in Alaska will know exactly how bright a full moon is. Really bright. Um, especially if it's reflecting off snow. You can read a book by the light of a full moon, easily. You do need to allow your eyes adapt to the darkness for a few minutes but it is kind of cool to do, sit out in a park and just read a book after your eyes have adjusted to the lower light levels. But your eyes, as I say, are amazing organs. Um, so it is quite bright here, and the brightness that you're seeing in this image results from the fact that we have a first quarter moon. Oh, oops, something happened, okay. It's just not changing. Oh, you can feel oh. okay. the middle one. It'll reset. It's like a funnel. That's the, that's the moon glow coming off the sensor. Come on. There. Okay, so I don't want to do that. Move that out. Chitty chat chat. Um, while they're still discussing the best way to um, yeah, I'd like to really do this one. set the parameters to observe the clown face nebula. There was a question in the chat quite far up that I haven't got to yet. Um, and it was, how did I get into astronomy? And I got into astronomy as a byproduct of enjoying physics. So. A lot of people go into astronomy because they get hooked on astronomy or they followed the Apollo program when they were very young or other space programs. They remember the Hubble Space Telescope being launched. I remember that, well, quite young for some of it, but um, it was interesting, but my first love was physics. When I was in high school, I took a physics class. I really liked it. I liked knowing how stuff worked. Um, so I went off to university fully expecting to major in physics. Actually, I took a whole bunch of science classes my first year. I took biology, chemistry, physics, uh, math, oh, and then a philosophy course. And I quickly realized I was not going to be a philosophy major. Um, various reasons pointed me in the direction of physics, and I realized by the time I got to second year that I needed a double major for a four-year degree. So I looked around and chose the double major that had the least number of non-pure physics classes. So my options were mathematical physics or chemical physics or geophysics. Um, or astrophysics. And the astronomy and physics degree had more physics classes and less of the astronomy classes than any of the others. So I think I had to take uh, seven astronomy classes and a whole bunch of physics classes versus ge geophysics, which took 10 geology and then a whole bunch of physics. So I really wanted to focus on physics. And then I took my first astronomy class. 
And I'm like, well, hello, <laughs> this is awesome. So it was physics, but physics of the stars. And it was explaining how stars shone, how they formed, how they evolved, how we could classify them. And it was, you know, the, the science and the physics of light and gravity. And I was hooked. I just thought, this is great. And yeah, so then I was very pleased I'd chosen astronomy as my companion to physics. And I went through and did a four year honors bachelor's of science in astronomy and physics. And then continued to grad school. Ooh, and now the dome lights are on. Can show them because we're, we're off. Yeah, let's the... go back to the dome view. There we go. So we're off the Clown Face Nebula. Where are we heading next? The Ghost of Jupiter, another planetary nebula. The Ghost of Jupiter, not Jupiter itself. Jupiter right now is up during the daytime sky. So from the perspective of Earth, when we look toward Jupiter as a planet, we're looking kind of past the sun, it's on the other side of the sun than we are in our respective orbits. So we're not looking at Jupiter tonight. Um, trying to get away from the moon. Yeah, the moon we're is trying very to escape bright. The moon. Escape the moon. Quite annoying. We can do it. But there, hopefully that explains how I ended up in yeah. astronomy and physics. Yeah. It was just something that I really liked. And Weirdly enough, back in my day, I never thought about getting a job. I just took physics and astronomy because I really liked the subjects. And the thought of getting a job never really occurred to me. And I'm thinking back now going, wow, was I just really naive or dumb? Or just, I just wanted to study what I liked. And then at the end of four years of university, I didn't really know what I was going to do. So I applied to teacher's college thinking was, I could teach there. physics. Um, and Teachers College didn't want me. But a professor thought I'd be a good grad student, so he hired me, or I applied for grad school on his recommendation, and, and I ended up being his graduate student. And then I stayed on through my master's, and some of the other profs thought I, and this is probably the best compliment I've ever got in my life, one of the profs said I was an above yeah. average so grad student, and I think my heart just melted that day because I'm like, I'm an above average grad student. Mostly because I was just really curious. I'd ask a lot of questions. And I stayed on for my PhD, and funnily enough, then I got a job teaching, which always kind of tickles me because Teachers College didn't think I was good enough to be a teacher, and yet here I am teaching. So there you go. So that's kind of my whole academic history. And, oh, look, you can see a few faces here, but I think much more interesting will be, what should we look at? We don't have anything to see through the attic yet, or the, well, the, we're still, we're still moving there, I think. Oh, we're still yeah. moving the telescope over and to the target. To... So the ghost of Jupiter is another planetary nebula, also known as NGC NGC something. NGC something. Yeah. Thirty-two so, forty-two. Thirty-two. Thirty-two forty-two. Oh, well done. Oh, thirty-two forty-two. So for those of you um, who heard me say a while ago yep. that there yeah. that all of these objects have different monikers, like the ghost of Jupiter and the snow, the blue snowball nebula, yes. which we're not going to get to, and then. Oh, that's pretty. Can I go to it? Sure. <laughs> um, We're just going to mess around with it. Sorry. You're going to mess around a little bit, but let's go over here and show you the view through the telescope. Oh. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, there's a red haze in the background. Nope, ah. not anymore. <laughs> so they're changing the parameters of the camera. I have, yeah. Oh, you know what? It's the city. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're so shooting over LA County. <laughs> so, so we've traded the moon for LA. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Why do we it. have a double view? 
Uh, he just moved it. Tom, oh, he just moved it. So there's clearly a delay here. New general catalog. Yes, I was getting to the NGCC. NGC, thanks, Tim. Uh, 1888, so not so new after all. But this was when it, this was a catalog that was reestablishing the brightness and other parameters of stars based on astrophotography with photographic plates, the glass photographic plates, as opposed to just observing with your eyes. Now, of course, everyone's eyes are different. How bright or how blue something looks to me may be very different than to you. How do we compare the two? Because we don't have, I mean, you don't have standards, but it's, there's some subjectivity to it. Once you start photographing, then it's a much more objective observation. So once uh, astrophotography with these glass photo photographic plates um, became a real thing, then I know Henry Draper catalog, um, it, the HD catalog is Henry Draper, but there yeah, know, were I'm other catalogs that this. were um, okay, introduced so in the late 1800s to take oh. advantage of this new fangled technology. So, introduce this red. That's pretty, can I look at it? Yeah, that's pretty much astronomy. We get the best, uh, honestly, in all the sciences, astronomy definitely has the best pretty pictures. I mean, like that. I mean, I'm just thinking oh, of geology. No, no, okay, no, you have okay. pictures of like the Grand Canyon, beautiful. I just took but we have nebulae, the and then we have <laughs> galaxies. It's a Photoshop. <laughs> so, Photoshopping in real does time. anyone know why this is called the ghost of Jupiter, by the way? It's supposed to look like the planet Jupiter. You know, uh, this is Jupiter. Lord Ross, isn't this? Is that the... Uh, let's see. That's true. And Lord Ross didn't observe much. No, his, he no. He was in but he was the one, I thought he was the one funding it, and he said, you know, it looks like this, and when your boss says, that's what it looks like, that's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Lord Wa Ross well, was, was this, he was Irish, him? wasn't he? An Irish lord who had money, and he was quite fond of astronomy, and he built could be a totally giant wrong. telescope. But really, never could observe much because Ireland is known for rain, and if it's Irish raining, you're not observing. So, yep. Ah, so this one is not. I'm totally wrong. This is not that one. <laughs> so it's called the Ghost of Jupiter because apparently the outer shell is about the size of Jupiter. Angular size of Jupiter. Okay, I was about to Angular say what? Size, sorry. The apparent so size of Jupiter. The outer kind of big good. shell. There's kind of an inner thing that looks vaguely like an eyeball. Um, but the outer shell, not the whole diffuse area that takes up almost the entire field of view. We're not talking about that, because that's, I think, sky glow. But the circle in the middle, that angular diameter is about the same angular diameter as the planet Jupiter. Now, what is that angular diameter? Couple of arc seconds. No, Let's more see, arc minutes. Say. Parent size, there we go. Point 0.7 arc minutes. Point 0.7 arc minutes. Nope, so for my students, together. you may remember back to unit, oh gosh, is this unit one? No, it is a long time ago, laughing the cosmos, where you learned about right ascension and declination and how we map the sky. And we have from horizon to horizon, which is basically yeah. half a circle, <laughs> um, if you're going to, you know, a, a, a dome above you, nice a hemisphere, um, that's 180 degrees. Each single degree is divided into 60 arc minutes, no, also known as minutes of arc. And then each arc minute is further divided into 60 arc seconds. So the diameter of the, the kind of the outer circle here, outer bubble, if you would, which is really hard to see right now because the whole thing is so bright, is 0.7 arc minutes. You're previewing, it doesn't matter. Okay. So that's three. So what we're going to do is we're going to try putting a filter in that should reduce the background. Ooh, a moon filter or sky filter? A sky, so it's called a nebula filter, so it's going to let through the light. 
of the nebula. Of the nebula, which is oxygen three, I think, or two. One of those. Okay. So, well, doubly ionized oxygen would be O3, I believe. Um, and that is totally blown out. Wow, yeah, that's well, bright. Yeah, well, they've taken it off the... Yeah. <laughs> it's going back in the telescope. It'll be back in so the So the camera has been taken out of the eyepiece holder. A special filter has been installed at the front end of the camera. So the light that has uh, been collected by the telescope is now going to be sent through the filter on the way to the light collection chip, the CMOS, just similar to a CCD. Let's see what we get. And this is, it's like looking at the edge of the sun. That red. Oh, now we have nothing. Hold on, hold on, I just gotta do this. <laughs> and there I'm giving is. you a hard time. There it okay, is. It's still, I think we, we were mid, we were mid exposure when it got put back in. So okay. let's see what we get next. So how many seconds exposure are we doing here? Uh, 23 seconds. 23 seconds. So every 23, so the, the, the telescope will um, but the stars are not saturated in the telescope. collect there the light for 23 yeah, seconds and then oh, spit out oh, the picture yeah, for us to look down, at. And then 23 seconds later, after it's finished collecting light again, it'll spit out the next picture. So there will be a 23 second lag between individual pictures. So we need to be patient, especially if Chris is going to adjust some of the background really parameters. Doesn't this is impressive. That <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem with the 60. The 60 gathers so much light yeah. that you actually can see them. Whereas if we pulled up the refractor, you'll see that it's a little dot. Yeah. No, this is, this is beautiful. But this is what we want. Or do you want to pull that over, Chris? Pull sure. over the, the, yeah. the view with the camera on the five inch refractor. Is that little? It's, yeah, the little blue dot on the left. Yeah, not the right dot. Well, that's a star, the little thing right there. That's, that's the ghost of Jupiter Nebula, planetary nebula. That's what we were looking at. So there are ZWO Pro cameras on each of the two telescopes. I'm going to have to change it so we know which one we're looking at. But I can tell you now that that one was the smaller refractive telescope. The refractor is a five inch primary lens. And this is a 60-inch primary mirror for collecting light. So it's collecting gobs and gobs and gobs of light, which is why things look so bright. And when things look bright, then our eyes can begin to see the color. Play with the levels. Why do you want to play with the levels? Let me try something new. Let's do this. Reset. Ooh. So is this new software we're using? It's not new. I mean, it's working properly on Richard's other computer. It's just on this computer, it seems to be mm. not glitchy. as it has glitchy to do with software. The I think it has. I don't know. Really? I think so. Yeah. All right. Let's let's try putting. All right. I'm gonna put it bump up the gain. Let's bump up the gain and just see what. Try and fill it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fill it. Um, let's see what we get. So there's a good question on the YouTube chat. Will we ever be doing a solar observation live? Ooh, not with this telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom just said, no, with this telescope, you would burn everything out. The director yes. has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> we did it with, unfortunately, we did it with the LUNT, which is a 100 millimeter um, specific telescope for looking at the sun and hydrogen alpha during the eclipse. Yeah. And um, we have an H alpha filter for the C8s. Yeah, you need a special filter. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, obviously, for looking at the sun, you don't want to look at the sun with your plain old the eyes the because the sun is can't. emitting so much light in our direction that that, that light overwhelms our retina and can damage our retina. Coming in and ret in our retinas yeah, are so the light uh, so collecting. Um, part of our eye at the, the game, back behind the lens yeah. and everything. So, um, ah, out of the solar towers came the question. The 150 yeah, foot? That's, that's a white light? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
so we can never do live stream from that. You but what what image you would you get? A filter on a camera and point it up at the sun, up at Just the uh, ceiling stand, it. and take an HL image. Huh. Yeah. I don't know that we ever have plans for that. Because usually, I mean, there's a bunch of us that get together and we're here in the evening. The sun has been kind of boring. What's that? The sun has been boring. Yeah, there aren't too many sunspots. I mean, we can go um, to have a look at the, in fact, hang on. Let me see if I can show you what the sun looks like these days. Um, Spaceweather.com has a lovely picture of the sun. Every day, new picture of the sun. So I'm not sure if this is going to show up well. Um, let me go back to OBS. Well, there's, huh. so it's not quite centered, but I just went to the website spaceweather.com. And on the left-hand side, there is a panel that has a little tiny mm -hmm. image of the moon, and you click on that, and then you can see the blown up moon. So there's actually a number of sunspots. Um, more than I've seen in quite a long time. So we have a group of sunspots, 2817, 2816, and then there's another one right at the, the left limb. Um, yeah, this is not the most maximum of, of solar maximums I've ever encountered, Alexander. This is, this is a very quiet solar maximum. Um, but there we go. So that is oh, that's from the live stack. The, uh, the sun, what it looked like the earlier today. Yeah. So this is a website that takes pictures of the sun every day and updates it. Whatever. And we can actually, I can go back there and then um, click on it to zoom in. And then you can see this little group of uh, sunspots here, 2816. They are, um, well, usually something about that size. Well, you can't see it now, but uh, the, the big one, the bottom left here of this group is probably about the size of the Earth. So sunspots, fairly sizable. And there's the darker area called the umbra, and then the lighter regions around it called the penumbra. And they are associated with strong magnetic fields. Blah, blah, blah. There's the sun. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the attic view. Click like a little to the right there. And you guys are having a real, image, or a real issue here. Well, we're starting to learn, Ah. <laughs> I think. Nothing like not uh, learning by doing. On work on the job. You can read all the extra There you are. That's you as want. good as we're going to get, I think, right there. That is pretty. That is great. In fact, that's really nice. So this is the ghost of Jupiter. This is the ghost of Jupiter. Which is kind of ghosty, next I suppose. We're heading towards uh, M3, so I'll let them know. Are we ready to go to the next one? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's 9.30, so we only have half an hour left. Someone was asking you, could we do M51? Oh, I saw that in the chat. Cycle yes. 25 just started. And I don't... <laughs> Tim is always plugging Mount Wilson, yes. So um, Mount Wilson was kind of the brainchild of George Ellery Hale. He was an amazing astronomer who built four largest telescopes in the world, successively. The Yerkes Telescope out northeast of, northwest of Chicago. Uh, yeah, northeast, there's a lake. Northwest of Chicago, and then the Mount Wilson 60-inch, the Mount Wilson 100-inch, and then the 200-inch at Palomar. Um, he was a solar astronomer, and he was the one that figured out that the sunspots um, were uh, cooler than the rest of the area. So, do we still have audio? I think we do. Yep. Okay. Yep. If you can hear me, can you just let me know? Because somebody lost audio. I don't know if 
that means everyone has lost audio. Okay, Tim can hear us okay. Thanks, Tim. And I know there is a delay between what I say and then what you can type because YouTube live stream has, I think it is a seven to 10 second delay. So, always a, a bit interesting. Right, we're so we're going to M3? No, uh, it's not quite visible yet. We're gonna wait, we're gonna go M, um, the Sombrero Galaxy. The Sombrero Galaxy. So, what can you tell me about the Sombrero Galaxy? It's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. It looks like a sombrero. We're, we're seeing it edge on. And the thing is, I don't see a sombrero. Eh. It's a, it's a galaxy with a very prominent dust lane. Yes. So, dust, I see, in abundance. Yeah. Why it's called a sombrero, I guess, because I the know. dust tends to make it look not uh, asymmetric. So it's we're more... Good. Uh, we're good to go, yep. Yeah. Uh, so it looks kind of more bulgy on top than on the bottom, so I guess it looks like a hat. And it's round and wide brim, so I guess... Disc wide brimmed galaxy. So I guess when you go through your list of kinds of hats, they looked at a bowler hat and thought, mm, it's no. too bulgy, not enough disc. <laughs> and saw some hey, arrow and thought, hey, there we go, that looks like a galaxy. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think if there's any type of hat that would have a wider brim than a sombrero. Not outside of a straw hat. Um, I suppose some straw hats, maybe if you go to Ascot. Um, but I think a sombrero, I'm trying to think of any other hat in the world. I'm not an aficionado on hats, what can I say? Although I did just put mine on because it is getting colder yeah, here in the dome. We are now down to 49 degrees, 49.8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is 9.9 .9 degrees Celsius. And if you're walking around, that's a decent temperature. But if you're just sitting here on a cold, hard chair, it's a bit chilly. So, oof. For giant big winter jacket that I know getting up to zipping right up. Somewhere I have gloves, but it's no, dark in here and I can't I'm, see anything. So I'll have to find those. I a, can't do that thing. A different time. Okay. I'm having down so we are yeah. legitimately seeing nothing right now. Yeah, well, yes, we are. Okay. We're still moving. Fair. We're still slewing the telescope. Do you, do you want to see which way the telescope is pointing? Because it's actually kind of low. Oh, sure. You mean turn the lights on? Yeah. Oh, dome lights coming on. We could there show we go. you. There we go. Oh, I found the gloves. There they are. Here you get a nice view of the underside. <laughs> All the uh, counter Oh, lights. I've never seen the underside from this angle. Kind <laughs> of looks just I'm looking at the, the bottom end. Lots of counterweights. <laughs> so what are the counterweights made of? Uh, lead. It is lead. Well, it's 1908. It would be lead. Now they'd be made of iron, but lead is more dense than iron. Okay. So, wow, I've never quite... It's like whew, right along my line of sight. All right, let's go back and have a look at the... Let's see what we got. View through the, the camera and nothing yet. You want to go over there for a oh. second? Let's do this. Uh, you're exactly what you were before. Why is that? The gain's way up, isn't it? You have, yeah, but you have the gain up right there. Yeah, that's pretty high. Oh, okay. and, and you do <laughs> there we go. All right, so now we do this. <laughs> now you go to life stack. Okay, now we go to life stack. Woo, look at that. That's uh And now we have the clear life stack, unfortunately. Okay. I and think there are some impressed astronomers here. <laughs> it's it's um it's a wee it's, big in it's this. big. <laughs> so this is a camera we have not used on this telescope before tonight, have we? No, this is actually the first time we This is it. this this is one of the reasons why there there's so much um 
Trust parameter me. shifting, I'll call it. I won't call it futzing around. Parameter shifting going on. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that is pretty cool. So this is a new camera that Richard, it's yours, right, Richard? Yes. That Richard just purchased. And this is the inaugural, I guess, first light on this camera via this telescope. And yes. this is this is beautiful. That's gorgeous. <laughs> that is gorgeous. So, um, yeah, let's see an amateur telescope do that in 22 seconds. <laughs> right? So the question was, is the filter still in place? Oh, goodness, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. So thank you, Arc Center of Excellence for Dark Matter, who pegged the, uh, the issue that is possibly uh, causing a... You can leave it in. Richard, it's good. Just leave it in. It's an LPR filter. Oh, it's just an LPR filter? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a Nebula filter. I thought it was an LPR Okay, so this was... LPR? Uh, oh, light pollution reduction. Okay, well then that's okay. It's not a nebula filter. We're good. Um, but you can still see how the city lights and the moon are yeah. causing it to illuminate only one side. Wow. So that so in case it's not clear, this is this dark lane. That's the dust lane the along dust the lane. disk of the galaxy. So this is a disk galaxy, um, somewhat the same shape as the Milky Way. So you can view it kind of as like a fried egg. There is a bulge at the center, like the yolk, um, that rises above and below the disk. And there are many, many, many stars in the disk. There's da gas, there's dust, there's lots of nebulae. In this particular disk galaxy, you can see it, it has a lot of dust. And that dust is, calling, is causing something called interstellar extinction. Or in this case, I guess it would be intergalactic extinction. Or just extinction, period. It is absorbing and blocking the light from further away to come towards us and reach our eyes and our equipment. So it's dust blocking the light basically what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine some sombrero astronomer looking back at us saying, wow, look at the Milky Way, <laughs> except they probably have a very different name for us, and they would probably not call their home galaxy the sombrero galaxy, but you know. Yeah. And you wonder if it, and from their perspective, would Andromeda be interacting with us? Yeah because the light that they would have gotten would have been millions of years ago. So how many, um, how far away is this? I'm looking that up uh, right now. Uh, 31 million light years away, says Tim. Tim, you should be up here. also known as M104. Have we talked about the M? We have not mentioned Ms. So there's NGC, which is New General Catalogs. There's uh, IC, there's HD, the Henry Drapper. Um, but there's M. M catalog is the Messier catalog, named after Charles Messier, who was an astronomer who was uh, an avid comet hunter. He loved looking for comets. And he lived in the 1700s, early or late 1700s. I can't remember. In the 1700s, a long time ago. <clears throat> and he would scan the skies with his small telescope. It was a refracting telescope. And he would look around. And if it was something kind of fuzzy, he would make a note of it. Because fuzzy things could be comets. And that's what he liked to look at. A comet, because it orbits the sun, moves differently than the stars move, just like the moon does. And the comet, a few days later, a few weeks later, a month later, would have shifted with respect to the background stars, the stars that are much more distant. But Charles Messier kept seeing these other kind of fuzzy things. And he would note where they are, their right ascension, their declination. 
And if he was scanning through and saw another fuzzy thing that he thought might be a comet, he would go back to his notes and see if he had observed it before. And he made a list of 111 or 110 objects that were not comets that he didn't care about, but these were prominent fuzzy things in the sky that he knew not to go back to. As it turns out, these were some of the most fascinating objects and beautiful objects to look at. So M1 is the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant, a supernova that went, that we observed going off in 1054 AD? Which one? Um, the Crab. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. 1054, I think the Chinese astronomers made a note of its position with respect to other stars. If you look at that position now, you will see the Crab Nebula, and that is a supernova remnant, and that is the star that went supernova. The star was visible naked eye back in 1054. Funnily enough, only the Chinese astronomers uh, have historical texts um, noting this observation. Nothing in Europe, nothing in the rest of the world that we can date to that time. So um, M104 is the Sombrero Galaxy. Yep. So this is something that Charles Messier noted, and then he didn't want to go back to it again because it wasn't a comet. But the, um, the view that you're seeing here, Charles Messier would never have been able to see this. So his, telescopes, his telescope would have been small, um, it's a refractor back in the 1700s. I mean, Galileo was the first person to point a telescope at the night sky that we know of. Um, telescopes had been invented a few years previously by, by blah, 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 a number, kind of concurrently, a number of op opticians in, I want to say, Denmark. There were three different opticians that went to the crown to get patents, but because they all tried to get patents at the same time, they said it was a common invention and it was unpatentable. So Galileo heard about this wonderful uh, setup of lenses and then decided, because of the magnification, he made his own. Undoubtedly, he started looking at like cows in distant fields and leaves on trees, and then he looked up at the night sky. And he was so amazed at what he saw, he started writing Wasn't about it. My adjustments. Telescopes for the next 150 or so years were, you know, better versions of Galileo's. They were refracting telescopes, um, and that's what Charles Messier would have used. So he would not have seen this image. I doubt he would have seen the dust lane. Um, he would have seen a diffuse area with probably a very bright center with his telescope. Um, Back in that day, they did not know that there was more to the universe than just the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, I think even back then, they weren't entirely sure what the galaxy was um, and the extent of the Milky Way. Our understanding that the Milky Way is just one galaxy among many, as in 100 trillion other galaxies, um, is less, that understanding is less than 100 years old. It was in the 1920s that um, Edwin Hubble realized by observations of the Cepheid variable that the Andromeda galaxy was far, far, far away from the Milky Way, outside the confines of the Milky Way. So other galaxies, Messi wouldn't have known. But we do have this wonder, wonderful catalog that he came up with and these M numbers, and they're pretty famous, um, they are the Messier catalog, as it's now known. So we are looking at Messier 104, which is also known as a Sombrero Galaxy. We'll also have an NGC number. We'll probably also have an IC number. Um, but there you go. Henry Draper was mostly stars, not galaxies. I don't know. There's some people who, thinks, who think it kind of looks like a sombrero. I suppose if you tip your head over to the side. I think it's because it has the glow on both sides with the dust lane splitting the center. Yeah. That it gave it a brim look. 
Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. It's impressive. This camera. So the, there's a question from our Australian dark matter friends. Um, is the camera at one by one binning? Yes. Okay. There was a there was a we, recommendation to try two by two. <laughs> to match our focal length on the 60 inch, which is over 24,000 millimeters. Uh, we need to go four by four. <laughs> And yeah, it's just, yeah, we are, the moment we are not online, we are going to play. And yeah. uh, we're going to test to see what we did. But right what now, we're capable of. Yeah, a 22 second exposure, that's insane. M53. To have something like that come up. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. And right now I'm playing with another one. So we have about 15, 14 minutes left We're go on the live stream. M53. We're going to do a cluster. M53. Oh, is this the one you wanted to do? No, M3 was the one you wanted to do. Well, three's a little bit further over. So oh, three's out of the... It'll be better next week, uh, next time. Yeah. So three is too far east then? It's too far east, yeah. Okay. So M3 is a globular cluster, and that is too far to the east of what our telescope can get down to. We can bring so this up if you like. Our telescope has limits. Oh, this, we could. We, yeah, let's go back to the telescope view. And we're, um, Richard is bringing over the view through his five inch refractor. And these are M81, M82? These are M65, M66, and NGC3826 called the Leo Triplet. <laughs> I'm so wrong. The Leo triplet. Awesome. So they are three galaxies. Are they gravitationally interacting? Ooh, that's a good question. I always have the good questions. I'm not sure I have the good answers. They're definitely in the same area of the sky if we can see it in the telescope. From our and perspective here triplet. on Earth, they are very close together. I would say they're probably within a degree or two. Oh, less than that. What's the field of view of your refractor? That's, it's pretty wide. Is it pretty wide, a couple degrees? Um, it'll probably put three M51s across it. Oh. Okay, it is a galaxy group. And we'll it, that it is a galaxy group, so they will be gravitationally interacting. They are still quite far, or their visual components are still quite far from one another. Um, for those of you who are in my class who have yet to learn about galaxies, there is a really uh, substantial and invisible component called dark matter, which I'm sure our Australian friends know all about because they are the arc center for, of excellence for dark matter. Um, so the dark matter in the galaxy, or within the confines of the galaxy make the confines actually much bigger than just the visible component that you're seeing. So they will certainly be interacting gravitationally. Um, dark matter is dark in that it doesn't emit, well, thank you, Richard. It doesn't emit. I didn't say well, anything. That was, my <laughs> that was your husband. Oh, was that my husband laughing at me? Yes. Oh, thanks, Chris. Um, so dark matter is dark in that it doesn't emit okay. light. Okay, we're going to let them absorb try to bring electromagnetic in the other one. radiation. It does not interact with electromagnetic radiation and at we're all. Going to it is, however, this and matter. Get out of life stage. Which means it has mass and it interacts gravitation. And you're trying to do so we cannot see it, and so the only way we know it exists is how it interacts gravitationally with stuff we can see. So we have to look for the stuff that we can see, and if it's moving weirdly, then there's some unseen component out there. Now, sometimes the unseen component is, at a later time, seeable. This is, in fact, how astronomers discovered Neptune, because they realized that Uranus was not orbiting the sun the way that they had um, projected, the way that they had anticipated. Oh, we're still moving. Okay. that it would orbit. And their 
uh, kind of diagnosis of the unusual behavior of Uranus was that there was some other massive object further from the sun that was gravitationally pulling on it okay. and affecting well, how it was orbiting it. It was orbiting. And they tasked some mathematicians with figuring okay. out, wow, okay, yep, we have a globular cluster. Oh yeah, now this is what we're going to be able to hopefully live stack. So they, they the, the back to the story of the discovery of Neptune. Yeah, Uranus was yeah, behaving poorly. The astronomers tasked mathematicians for figuring out how massive the object would be and where it would be to account for the unusual orbiting of Uranus. And the, the mathematicians nailed it. So for those of you who don't think math isn't useful in real life, read that story. It's awesome. The discovery of Neptune. Um, so sometimes things are just very faint and you have to know where to look to be able to actually see them. Um, sometimes things are quite bright. These stars here that we're looking at right now are actually pretty bright. There's something weird coming. What's the deal here? All we can do is can we can do this. We'll do undisconnected and then reconnect it. Okay, disconnect and reconnect. That's yeah, just like the see. famous well, they turn, turn, it turn it off, turn it on again. <laughs> That is, by the way, for my students, what I did on Monday game? to figure out how to I, get the Wi-Fi in the I planetarium. So I rebooted my computer oh, and uh, logged off to my account and logged back on. And then, lo and behold, right after class ended, I got the dome Wi-Fi. Yay! That will mean that I will have internet for tomorrow. Yay! We need some focus. That's we need some focus? We need a little focus. Okay. But he has to wait for the refresh, though. We can start the exposure and put the gain up and then get Our gain's at 400. <laughs> can you see? We may have to go higher. Uh, let's try, try doing the auto thing again. That's better. So this is going to be our last target for this evening. So this is a beautiful globular cluster. I can do this one. Right now we're focusing on the stars, but in a 23 second exposure, it'll take a picture and then it'll be, it'll start stacking well, and then you have to like seconds, focus so. a little bit. And then you won't see the results of your efforts of refocusing no, for uh, 46 seconds oh, because that 23 second exposure is going to yeah, be all over the place and then you need another 23 second exposure. So I think they've shortened the exposure time and upped the gain, so... So we can focus. That's so good. you can focus. That's good. Well, that's a bit better. So this is that's a globular a cluster. Time. And you may going, may be saying to yourself, what the heck's a globular cluster? Well, it is essentially a bunch of stars globbed together. Uh, it's a pretty self-explanatory name. Globular clusters yeah, tend this? to have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of stars within them. For the most part, globular clusters are really old uh, collections of stars, which means that they don't have any massive stars. Massive stars on the basis of their mass have a lot of pressure on the core and the nuclear fuel in the core fuses very quickly because the high pressure creates a high temperature and the high temperature, the higher the temperature, the faster the nuclear fusion rate goes. So very massive stars um, have very high fusion rates. They burn through their nuclear nuclear fuel very quickly, and then they go out. Globular clusters are older groups of stars. We know this simply because there are no massive stars left. And in a giant molecular cloud, within which many stars form, there will be low mass stars, there will be medium mass stars, there will be high mass stars, there will be stars of every mass. They all form at the same time. The, the more massive ones, the most massive ones evolve first, and then the more massive ones evolve, and then you get to medium mass stars, and, and you work your way down. The, the low mass stars last the longest in the universe. So these globular clusters are old. We know they're old because they don't have any of these high mass stars left. And these globular clusters are also not in the plane of the disk galaxy. They are either above or below the plane of the galaxy. 
in a region known to astronomers as the halo. Now, I, when I think of halo, I think of an angel with a little ring around its head, kind of, you know, from cartoons or what I thought when I was a kid. The halo of a galaxy is a sphere. It is a region, a spherical region around the yeah, disk. Yeah, and you're get, get, if you're getting an internal reflection. Within which globular clusters are found. And how many globular clusters do they estimate the Milky Way has? I thought it was just over 100. Yeah, there's like, I was thinking 10? between 100 and 200. Yeah, so, yeah. so there's, um, that we have seen. Because there may be some on the far, yon side of the galaxy that we can't see through all the dust in the plane of the galaxy if it's perfectly lined up with the dust from our perspective. We may not be able to see it well. So they're always learning new things about the Milky Way. But there is between 100 and 200 globular clusters that are part of the Milky Way galaxy, that are okay. in the halo, and that orbit the supermassive black okay, hole that's at the very center of the galaxy. So within the bulge, like the bulge you saw in the Sombrero galaxy, there is a bulge in the Milky Way. At the very center of that, there's a supermassive black hole that we have named Sagittarius A star, which is an unusual name. It is in the region of Sagittarius. It is the brightest component, or the brightest region in the radial wavelengths um, in the Sagittarius constellation. And the star is the very center where the mass is concentrated. So we have a supermassive black hole that has a mass of about four million suns. And everything in the galaxy seems to orbit that region. So these globular clusters way out there in space are orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Ah, Tim says there's over 150 catalogued. I was in the right ballpark. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. M53 Wikipedia est age estimate is 12.67 billion years. So about a billion years shy of the age of the universe. That's a pretty, pretty young, young galaxy there. M53. Oh, hang on. M53 is the globular cluster. What am I? Oh, not M104. Really? That glob is that old? Or this glob is that old? That's impressive. That's... Okay. Oof. Yeah. Definitely no massive stars left in, in a globular cluster that's 12.67 billion years old. So do we know how many stars, an estimate of the number of stars make up this galaxy? Because my laptop with all the details was taken away to the other side of the dome here. Focused. It was focused, and now it's out of focus. Gentlemen, we are going to have to wind down this fabulous live stream. I know Richard is itching to get his fingers oh. on the <laughs> on the the uh, equipment to just have some trials for what he's doing. But we've got a couple minutes left, so I'll open it up. I got one more toy to show. Oh, he's got and, one more thing to show. Oh, one more thing to show. Okay. Bring it on over, Richard. This is through his refracting telescope. Wow. That is not an image that has been grabbed from the internet. That is a live, but a stacked image, yeah? No, it's a single frame, right? Well, right That's right a single frame. What's the exposure time? 60 seconds. <laughs> it is 60 seconds exposure. <laughs> we are that cheating. That is beautiful. So what are we looking at, Richard? This is M51. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. The whirlpool and the little thing on the bottom left that's that's unfortunately his friend who um, <laughs> is, being is ripped losing apart. yes he's losing the fight right now yep which is uh, is it m52 i believe uh, m50, uh, m51b m51b yeah i bet you messi couldn't even distinguish between m51 and this little companion to the bottom left wow what are you doing? I'm making it brighter. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's playing with the uh, the level. So that that thing he's doing on the bottom that shows a histogram of the pixel values, 
and that kind of gives you an idea of what the darkest part you want and what the lightest part you want, and you sort of try and dial that in. Yeah. Plus, on since it goes through this whole thing to YouTube, it gets compressed, and I noticed that what looks too bright here looks yeah. good over there. Yeah. Yeah, and then looks really good on YouTube over here. Um, anyway, it is 10 o'clock. And I do want to wrap this up. I think this is a perfect image to end our live stream this evening. So for everyone out there from Michigan to Alaska to Burbank to oh, Australia, Australia, Australia. Glendale and Pasadena and Australia, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we will be doing this all again in two weeks. So if you're interested, come on back and see what we're going to be looking at through our fabulous dome at that time. But for right now, I'm going to say good night from all of us up here at Mount Wilson, presently in the dark. Hey. Not so dark. All right. Good night, everyone. I think seeing was starting to go away. I think it's bad over here. And um, because I took this, I took a picture of this last night. <laughs>